Okay, uh, so the, the last uh, presentation in, in this panel, um, it's uh, Amanda Sanada Fernandez Aceres, and she'll be talking about nothingness and freedom, a comparative analysis between Nishtani, KG, and Meister Eichhardt's perspectives. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here in the third NLJP. JP. It's always a pleasure to be among friends. And uh, I would introduce this paper saying that it's not my main subject of work. So I'm looking forward to hear from you what, comments and questions. So uh, my aim is uh, to analyze how far the Christian and the Buddhist philosophers uh, the concept uh, or interpretation of freedom, uh, this freedom provoked by the nothing or the emptiness, uh, could be seen as a ontological answer where one could uh, reach the reality in itself and its truth, especially one can um, um, meet the true self. So you, we are talking about authenticity too, so it's related <laughs> with Caio's and uh, Carlos' uh, papers. So I will divide this uh, presentation talking first about Eckhart, uh, then uh, saying something about uh, some Japanese uh, philosophers who uh, talk, talked about Eckhart, and then uh, talking about Nishitani Keiji, who is uh, my main subject of work on my PhD thesis, and then conclusions. So, uh, Master Yerkat is a Dominican priest, so it's a Dominican priest in my, in my, sub, uh, in my uh, abstract, it's wrong, it's written wrong. So, uh, Eckhart is a Dominican priest known, by, uh, known as a mystic philosopher who made a distinction between uh, God and Godhead. Uh, so looking for a solution to the problem, who is God, uh, we, uh, which is the essence of God, uh, Mestri Eckhart propose a distinction between God and Godhead. So in this case, God is the uncreated creator. In this interpretation, there is a distinction between uh, the created uh, the human being and the absolute transcendental God. Uh, for Eckhart, uh, this is a, a personal view of God that as a being is analyzed by concepts, concepts and representations. But uh, this raises a question from him. Uh, so how can one uh, be related with this personal God? How can one achieve this personal uh, perspective of God? Uh, so he says, and I quote Master Eckhart, I pray God to make me free of God, for his unconditioned being is above God and all distinctions. Uh, in another, another place he says, the authorities say that God is a being, an intelligent being who knows everything, but I say that God is neither a being nor intelligent, and he doesn't know neither this or that. God is free of everything, and therefore he is everything. And he also says, if I had a God, I could understand. I would no longer consider him God. So for Eckhart, God is above all distinctions or dualism. He has no attributes or as intelligence. He is not understandable by human rational capacity. So for us here, the, the most important passage is that one that Eckhart says, I pray God to make me free of God. So the question is, who is he pray, pray for? Who is he praying for? Eckhart is, is expositing here this distinction between God and Godhead, the personal God and the essence of God. He says, do you know how God is God? God is God because there is nothing of the creature in him. The Godhead is nothing, ineffable. It's not representational, cannot be conceptualized or characterized. So 
How can the man or the soul be in relation with God? The answer is detachment. He says in On Detachment, and I quote, the best and the highest virtue whereby a man may chiefly and most firmly join himself to God and whereby a man may become by grace what God is by nature and whereby a man may come closest to his image when he was in God, wherein there was no difference between him and God before God made creatures. So in fact, uh, it's not a matter of being like God or being uh, united with God because God's not an object to be united with. But what Eckhart proposes by the experience of detachment is to be one with God. For Eckhart, detachment means freedom because it's the birth of God in the soul. To make this possible, man must lose the will and the self. It is abolished any dualism between self and God, or creator and creature, creator and creature. By that, the soul and God are in their home ground of nothingness, in its truth. When man treads this path toward God and becomes one with him, the soul returns to have a more fundamental relationship with its essence. In other words, the Godhead and the soul become one, which enables man to be what he is in his essence. For Eckhart, this means freedom. When Eckhart says that God's nothing, clearly, clearly he's not saying that there is no God. In fact, what he aims is to keep the mystery that is in the secret. So this freedom, this freedom is a freedom from all created things. By being detached from all beings, man comes closer to God and as well as to his own ground, which is nothing. So freedom means freedom from the will, from the self, uh, the creation perspective, and the illusory God. So uh, Eckhart, negative theology uh, and the relation with Buddhism, it's, it's not a new subject. In fact, uh, D.T. Suzuki, in his book, Mysticism, Christian and Buddhist, sees similarities between Eckhart's pure nothingness and Trinyata. Uh, Shizu Ueda, a third generation of the Kyoto School, he also uh, he wrote a PhD dissertation about Eckhart uh, and several other uh, tests about the relation of the medieval philosopher and the Buddhism. Uh, how, however, our, um, my aim here is bring some questions in light about the concept of freedom relating uh, with Nishitani's perspective. So in religion and nothingness, Nishitani, uh, a philosopher of the Kyoto School, reads Eckhart's thought in light of the contemporary problems um, of philosophy, as for example, the rising of nihilism and uh, the necessity to overcome it and the necessity to overcome modernity, uh, the modern modernity perspective of self. So uh, Nishitani looks in the West uh, for a more accurate, uh, according to him, a, a more accurate answer uh, to the problems that are rad radicalized in the modern era. Uh, what in fact could be seen as anachronism because uh, Eckhart wouldn't have the, the modern elements to, uh, um, to develop a critic or to think about uh, these problems. Eckhart uh, is well known by some important Buddhist philosophers and had his thought characterized by Suzuki, and I quote, closely, uh, his thought is closely approached uh, Buddhist thoughts. So closely indeed that one could stamp them, uh, his thought, uh, almost defin definitely as coming out of Buddhist speculations. 
So Nishitani in 1938 published an essay titled uh, uh, Nietzsche's Zarathustra and Masyrkat. Uh, it was short short time after he came back from his studies of, with Heidegger in Freiburg. And besides that, in religion and nothingness, Nishitani characterized Eckhart as who offers as the most radical example of negative theology. Nishitani says, in our times, when human subjectivity and the confrontation between the subjectivity and God have become the great problems that they are, the thought of Master Eckhart uh, seems to me to merit serious reconsideration. So, however, uh, he seems to read Eckhart under the influence of the Buddhist thought, maybe because of that he uses the same term that was known in the philosophy of Nishida Kitaro, uh, absolute nothingness, to designate the nothing uh, of the Godhead in Eckhart. In that way, we could say that uh, he sees no distinction between the concept of the time and night. Um, so as we said, Nishitani is looking for a perspective which would overcome the problems, and I quote him, hidden at the ground of the historical frontier we call the modern world. In other words, the Cartesian dualism and the egocentric modern subjectivity, the problem of the nihilism, and uh, uh, especially the problem that would be in the ground of all these contemporary issues, the ontological perspective. For Nishitani, the solution to these problems would be in the encounter with the field of emptiness, shunyata, where the reality has no substance or essence, the things are in their home ground, where everything is connected or related in interdependence. Uh, he calls this relationship between things, including man in the field of emptiness, as circumstantial. In that way, everything is master and servant of each other. And I quote him. I quote Einstein, to say that a certain thing is situated in a position of seven to every other thing means that it lies at the ground of all other things. That is a constitutive element in the being of every other thing, making it to be what it is and thus to be situated in an opposition of autonomy as master of itself. In other words, it means that everything possesses no sub substantiality in the ordinary sense, that it is a non-self nature. It's, being, it's a being in unison with emptiness. It's a being possessed of the character of an illusion. Uh, I mean, everything, as he says, everything is, uh, there is n it's empty, it's empty in the way that everything is related. Um, but how to achieve this perspective capable of overcoming the most basic foundation of the West philosophy as a concept of self or ego, nihilism and substance? The answer for Nishitani is in the different. It, it is in a different a way to see religion. Uh, he sees religion as a way of living. He says, besides. Uh, Besides the current interpretation of religion, religion as, for example, the relation between man and God, I quote him, I should like instead to approach religion from a somewhat different angle as the self-awareness of reality, or more correctly, the real self-awareness of reality. So in another, in another moment uh, in religion, often it's he says, and I quote, religion upsets the posture from which we think of ourself, uh, ourselves as tellers and center of all things. Instead, religion po possess uh, as a, poses as our starting point the question, for what purpose do I exist? So in this case, religion brings uh, the doubt that makes men question reality, their sense and our own subjectivity. Thus, be aware of the ground of emptiness for Nishitani means absolute freedom. <coughs> freedom of the category of concepts and representation of the ego's perspective. Freedom of the, uh, 
the category of substance for Nishitani freedomins that we and the world are in our home ground and in the way in that way we can be in our true self and realize the reality in suchness. He says realize because he has he is trying to avoid the dualism between uh, me and the thing as a knower and as the thing that uh, the knower wants to, to know. Uh, so I conclude here. So as I said, aside from the fact that they, they have a very different historical background, if uh, on the one hand, Nishitan is worried about the overcome about to overcome the abuses provoked by modernity, going beyond dualism between subject and object, which ultimately leads to a critic to ontology. On the other hand, Eckert is concerned about the limits of language, cognition, and the problem with the, pro the problem of the human's relation with God in a context of crisis of faith. But uh, they both have big similarities. In other words, in Eckhart's attempt to overcome the personal God through the Godhead, the medieval priest is overcoming the traditional categories of metaphysics because, in his point of view, God is not the highest being as sees Veda, and, and this is Veda's critic um, about Eckhart. Uh, so it's not a highest being as sees Veda in his critic to Eckhart, nor a, subsent, a, sub, a substance or a thing. In Caputo's uh, opinion, Eckhart is talking about an event, an activity, in which God and the soul embrace. In that way, Eckhart gives a step back out of metaphysics as, a critical, <coughs> as critical as Nishitani's thought may be. Although Eckhart means main goal doesn't seem to be to develop a critic to metaphysics, but to show how God can, cannot be seen as a transcendent, aside, omnipotent, omnipotent figure, but must be seen in our everyday life, in the world itself. In this sense, as many Buddhist philosophers after him confirms, his ideas are not far from Buddhist speculation. So it is interesting to point out how both thinkers uh, with cultural, religious, and historical divergences could also from a distinct, uh, distinct philosophical question agree with the importance to reach freedom by the experience of no, uh, with uh, nothing or emptiness. In that sense, Eckhart and Nishitani has in common a religious-oriented thought where a negation results in an affirmation. The encounter with nothing uh, or emptiness is the most elemental one, cons consider considering that it means freedom from the illusory point of view of representation and transcendence, confirming the encounter with our home ground right here in the everyday Word. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for the presentation. Uh, we have uh, plenty of time, more than 10 minutes actually, for uh, questions and uh, comments if you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's very interesting and yeah, it's definitely a connection between sort of Nishitani and um, Eckhart when they sort of have their ideas of becoming one with God or one with emptiness. I was just wondering about whether you'd consider that actual freedom. So for me, it's not I'm trying to conceptualize, it's not so much ontological freedom, but sort of comfort. Comfort. Mm. So in a sense, they're restricted. So when you think with, when you're at home, so you sort of think in terms like a home ground, when you're at home, you're kind of restricted by walls, but nevertheless you feel comfortable there. You feel that like nothing is going like, to trouble you. So I don't know if it, it's actually 
you should conceive of it as like freedom, sort of being at one with God or sort of arriving at the home ground of existence because you then realize that whenever you act sort of on the home ground, for example, you have sort of commitments to things which you're related to. So, so I'm not too sure if it's actually freedom or not, or whether we should use like another term to define that, such as like emptiness is comfort, or being at one with God is comfort instead of freedom. Yeah, uh, what I mean by freedom is uh, it's uh, related with uh, how be in this uh, home ground in nothingness could be seen as an authentic, authentic way of being, because in, in both thinkers, this could be seen as being in, in our true, in our truth, right? In our uh, true way of being. So we would be free of uh, this bunch of, um, Concepts uh, like uh, I mentioned, like uh, representation, like uh, substance. So, so in that way, this freedom would mean uh, freedom from the ontology, ontological way of being. Autological way of see the reality. So, I don't necessarily see like freedom is always like a positive thing. So it can be the mm -hmm. so we think of in the West and sort of the breakdown of the, the the loss of the teleological end. So I think that people believe that sort of God made them and that kind of gave their lives purpose because you live according to God's ten commandments and then you'd be rewarded with internal afterlife. Mm -hmm. So people find comfort in that, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily have freedom because it's something they have to do. Mm -hmm. so they don't necessarily live a good life, but it's not a bad thing, but they just don't have freedom, mm -hmm. but they have like an end goal. So I wonder maybe it'd be better to think of it in terms of that as opposed to... I see. Maybe you could think of it like teleologically rather than mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of freedom. <laughs> yes. But if I can mention something, precisely to that respect, mm. well, it's interesting that you put it in terms of, uh, of, of um, well, put it in those terms, because it's true that we need, to, if we want to talk about freedom, we need to understand, well, what's the, what's the, I mean, it, it's impossible to talk about freedom without talking about will, mm -hmm. but that's probably a clue here. Mm. Um, what constitutes a free will? That's another way of saying what is freedom, how to attain freedom. And in a certain way, Eckhart deals with this, if I remember well. There is an, a, a book chapter written by a Colombian philosopher, Margarita Cepeda, uh, last year, I think. And I think it addresses precisely this. Even though her topic is not directly Eckhart, she's quite inspired by Eckhart, think, uh, well, Eckhart thought. The idea is, her question is, what kind of uh, will is uh, a will of God that I could accept, that I could freely accept? And she compares uh, the God of, well, she goes back to the case of Abraham, when he, when, and the, the sacrifice of uh, Isaac, and uh, she asks, well, at first it seems that's not the kind of will of God that I would accept. Because it's immoral. Mm -hmm. God asks Abraham to kill his only God, his only son, sorry. That's unacceptable on moral grounds. Uh, well, it's more complex than that, but anyway. To go to the point, uh, she says there's a difference between uh, the God that tells Abraham, go and sacrifice your only son that I promised I would give you. And the God that finally says, stop, don't sacrifice your own son. And I think the difference is, or the way she diagnoses the, 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 the difference goes in line with Eckhart's thought in this sense, that uh, the will, first, in the first case, human will is a, 
sees the will of God as something outside, mm -hmm. as opposed. While in the second case, the will of God is my own, the nature at the bottom, or to put it in Nishtani's terms, the home ground of my own will manifests just as it is. Not in terms of concepts, but freely as it is in, in, the, in the nothingness, so to speak. And I think that Nishitani would agree, because it seems that the way he analyzes, uh, in another context, uh, law, uh, the me mechanical law, seems to go in line with that. It is quite, there's quite a difference when we see law as something opposed to us, that imposes over us, and as something that is within us, and then <laughs> we can become the actualization of the law of nature. Mm -hmm. And the transformation is radical. In one case, we are slaves, we are merely marionettes, and in the second case, we become free. I think that, well, I, I, I strongly agree with you in the sense that, yes, this is freedom. Ekerai is talking about freedom here, authentic freedom. But it's a freedom that changes radically because it requires that we set, well, we become free from the constraints of the mode of being from which conceptual thinking emerges. And it's a, it's a, it's a change, it's a radical change of mode of being. It's not only a matter of, of a the limits of conceptual thought, but it's an ontological matter. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Instead of asking questions, there's a debate going on. <laughs> yes, um, yes, you answer better than me. It's, uh, uh, we are talking about uh, a ontological answer, uh, uh, a, a, a other way to see reality of uh, uh, overcoming the limits of um, not only our behavior and our will, but uh, 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 but to um, what we are, not limited by a, a concept of essence anymore. So it's basically what uh, Carlos was saying. So in that sense, it would be freedom. Does <laughs> <laughs> uh, anybody else uh, have any other questions or comments? We still have three minutes, I think. Questions or comments? Uh, seeing the reality as it really is is the key issue, I think. I have problems defining this reality mm -hmm. because there are so many realities. There are. There are. <laughs> They are things, entities, mm -hmm. they are minded things like animals or mm -hmm. human beings as well. They are instit institutions mm -hmm. like universities, education systems. Mm -hmm. um, and, and summing this up all under the whole, this big group room reality, I have my problems with that. Uh, how can you distinguish these different areas of reality? Because I can imagine that understanding an institution requires different f faculties than understanding or recognizing such a thing like this, mm -hmm. chaos. Um, I always have my problems with this vast notion of reality mm -hmm. um, and that we are to <coughs> recognize or understand or yeah, the true reality as it is in itself. Well, okay, but <laughs> there are so many levels or areas of reality that you should uh, allow for different modes of uh, approaching these realities. Um, well, uh, as Carlos said in his presentation, Nishitani is a uh, reality formed by this uh, interrelation. Yeah, that's a question. So, for instance, in interrelatedness between humans, human beings, and interrelatedness between an animal and myself, I don't think that's the same. Mm -hmm. Because here we have some recognition, we have some common practices we subscribe mm -hmm. to and we have to sustain 
we don't have this in animals, for mm -hmm. instance. So there are levels, areas, which cannot be reckoned up or circumscribed by one notion alone. Mm, I see. Well, as, as in Shetani sees, uh, there is no, no distinction between... Yeah, that's a big problem, I think. Yeah. yeah. There is no that's distinction. Big. So what, what it is, is yeah. relation. Uh, in this sense, I can be, as he said, a uh, servant, or I, I, uh, I cannot be the servant. So what, what's happened all the time is relation. In this sense, there is no, there is no thing that's better, or it's in a yeah. position of than others. Yeah. yeah, so he is an existentialist feel, feel as of after all. <laughs> Every time begin anew, <laughs> radically. <laughs> yeah. Right? I don't see how this could work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it's... <laughs> Something to think about it. Thank you for a comment, very powerful comment. And with that, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt this, but we have to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, we're uh, actually out of time. Uh, thank you very much again for this uh, for the presentation. Thank you to uh, thank all, you. all three presenters. Thank you. Thank you.